Welcome to the Tacoma Park Solar Co-op meeting. I'm Gina Mathias, the Sustainability Manager for the city, and it is with great pleasure I can now introduce you to two solar experts, Anya Schoolman, the Executive Director of the Community Power Network, and Chris Hazel, the Program Director for Maryland. Community Power Network is organizing the Tacoma Park Solar Co-op to help everybody get a discount on going solar at home. The Community Power Network works with communities, nonprofits, and homeowners to go solar and on renewable energy product projects. And then they work with the Maryland Sun Network for ongoing support for homeowners and communities. So I will turn it over to you to get started. Thank you so much, Gina. Thanks so much for inviting us into your community. We're thrilled that Tacoma Park has a paid full-time sustainability director now, and she seems to be doing amazing work. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about ourselves and our history, a couple minutes. Then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the solar co-op process, which is the top of this handout you have here. And then I'm going to talk to you about how much does it cost to go solar and spend a little time going through the incentives. But I am very comfortable being interrupted and answering questions all along the way. Um, the one caveat is that because we're filming tonight, if you have a question, you go and stand at the microphone and I will just call on you and we'll, we'll keep asking questions and moving on through the process. Um, I'm really uh, excited to be here. We've been wanting to do a co-op in this area. Uh, first, a little bit about myself. I got into solar by accident. It happened uh, many years ago. It was 2007. I had a son at the time who was 12, Walter, who had come, had gone and seen the movie Inconvenient Truth. And he came home and he's like, Mom, we've got to do something. We can't wait for the government. They're never going to do anything. Let's go solar. And we tried. We called a bunch of installers. They came to our house, we live in DC, totally confusing, totally expensive, overwhelming, we didn't know what to do. So I said to Walter at the time, look, if we're gonna go to all the trouble to figure this out, let's do the whole neighborhood, because at least it'll have a bigger impact. And to tell you the truth, I thought I was being that clever mom who didn't want to squash the dreams of the, tw the young teenager, but really was trying to get out of the project. But what happened is Walter and his best friend Diego created this flyer and it said, do you want to join the Mount Pleasant Solar Co-op? And would you go solar if it costed the same as you're paying now or less? Or uh, you know, under what conditions? And it had a little survey about how much energy do you use? And these two 12-year-old boys went zipping up and down the steps of all the houses in my neighborhood in Mount Pleasant near the zoo. And two weeks later, we had 50 homes signed up, and we had no idea what we were going to do. So what happened was really a two-year education process where we learned about solar. We learned about the equipment. We learned about the brackets and the panels and the tax incentives and how the market was structured. And then we got involved in a piece of legislation in DC that helped create an incentive for solar. And in 2009, we helped 45 houses go solar. In, in our neighborhood. And that was the launch of both my solar, accidental solar career and the Mount Pleasant Solar Co-op. After that, what happened is very similar to what's happening here tonight, which is neighborhoods all over the metro area started coming to us and saying, hey, we want to do that too. And it often would be a homeowner, sometimes it would be a government person, sometimes an NGO, maybe a, it was a green team or a sustainability office. Um, Recently, for example, um, Bob Bartolo, who's a physicist at the University of Maryland, it was about, what, a year and a half ago? He came to us, he's like, I wanna do that here. And so we started a co-op with the University of Maryland and the Sustainability Office of the University of Maryland and ended up, do you remember how many people signed up for that one? Yeah, we had 145 signups for that co-op. And we're, they're still doing the installation. Still running, yep. So, we just did one in Hyattsville, um, really, really exciting. It was just a group of homeowners got together. Um, we've done, I think, 18 groups at this point. And each group, I think what's different about our process is that it's really run by you all. 
So what we see ourselves as is the technical support and the facilitators to the process. We don't run the process, we don't tell you what to do, we don't tell you what your values are. In fact, when you sign up to be in the co-op, the first thing you do is fill out a poll which is, says what's important to you. And that is taken into account when the installer's selected. That's the other really big difference between our approach and other approaches that you might hear about in the area, is that you all are gonna pick the installer. We help you and support you through that process, but it's actually the community's choice, and they get to insert their values, what's important to them. Is it a local installer, American-made panels, local employment? Um, do they pay a fair wage? Every community has different issues that they value differently, and so those are the kinds of things that you have the opportunity to include in the process. That's a good segue for me to talk about what is the bulk process in general. And after I talk about the process, I'm gonna pause for a second for questions about the process before we go into equipment and the, and the economics. But just in terms of the process, the first step, as you can see on this um, handout on the infographic, is attend an info session. We like our members to be educated. We are here as consumer advocates. We don't work with a particular installer. We are here to help you in the process. Um, for those of you who are curious, like how do these guys, you know, what's the catch? We do get paid. We get paid by the installer for signed contracts. Um, but to us, it doesn't matter which installer, it's the same. So for us, what's important is that you guys have a good experience. And we stick with you from the beginning of the process, the education, not through the installation and beyond. So for example, if a year later you're having problems with is everybody here Pepco? If you're having problems with Pepco or if it's gonna be Exelon in the future, we might write a letter or do an intervention on your behalf if you're having problems with your billing. So we are our soup to nuts through the process before, during, and after. So anyway, the first step is sign up. When you, uh, I mean the first step is the info session. Learn about the equipment, learn about the economics. Decide if you're serious. If you're serious, you go online and you sign up. At that point, you're, what you're doing is filling out this poll, which I described, and giving us your name and your address. And that is joining the co-op. It means you're a, it's a serious commitment of interest. It is not a contract or a formal commitment. We don't ask for money. Um, there's no binding contract. It just shows that you're serious. We really don't want you to sign up if you're just at the learning stage. We want you to keep learning at the learning stage. We want, we to, want you to sign up when you think, yeah, I really think I want to do this. The next thing that's going to happen is one of our team, it'll probably be Chris here, is going to look at your roof remotely. He's going to look at Google Maps, he might look at Bing Maps, he might use a couple other online applications, and he's going to um, at least take a quick assessment. If you have a shady roof, you're going to get an email from us or an otherwise unsuitable roof, bad angles, um, looks like there's holes in your roof or vines growing on your roof and you need to replace your roof first, um, bad orientation. Um, you're gonna get an email from us that says, we're really sorry, but it looks like your roof is not a good fit for solar. Um, as somebody brought up, we do not advocate cutting down trees. Um, if your roof is shady, you should keep the trees there and keep your house cool. I'm gonna stop for a question. Uh, hi. So. Um We've talked to some other uh, leasing companies before, and they look at like the Google Maps to get like the view. But we had a big tree that was over our house that's since been cut down, and Google has not updated their maps. So we get these like responses where I'm sorry, we can't help you, but it's quite sunny in our house. So. That's that we hear that all the time, and that's why you're dealing with just you know us and Grant and Emily. It's Anya, Chris, Grant, and Emily. So if you got that email from us. What we would expect back is an email that says exactly that. Hey, Google Maps isn't up to date. I got a big sunny roof. And then we're like, great, you're in. That's pretty much it. <coughs> so it's, it's very, it's not, there's no computers involved in, you know, making the decision. So that's a perfect example. And sometimes with people, we might go back and forth three or four times. Typical thing would be, um, 
looks like your roof maybe is not in good shape. How old is your roof? Oh, I don't know how old my roof is. And so we might have a conversation about that because we don't want people, you know, if you've got literally in my neighborhood, sometimes people had a hundred year old roof. We're like, it's not good to put solar on a hundred year old roof. So you need to have a roof that's going to last, hopefully, the life of the solar. Um, the next step after getting the roof review is that we, once about uh, 30, 20 to 30 people sign up, and the exciting news is we've already got 10 people signed up, just so we're already, today's the launch, we've already got 10 people on board. Once we get that many people signed up, we issue a request for proposal um, to its solar installers in this area. We have worked with many, many installers, but we are very, very dedicated to the idea that the solar market is healthy, thriving, transparent, and has many, many players. So we always issue a public request for proposal. We will typically get between eight and 12 bids on a group. Um, at this point, we know the installers in this area, and the installers knows us. So what's really different about our group than some others that you might have heard of is that they know that they're educated, serious people on our list. We let the installers check out the roofs to get a sense of the geographic distribution. We try to cluster people. We try to give them very serious leads. And that translates into a really, really incredible prices. And uh, I keep telling people we get up to 30% discount for our members. And when I talk to people at the US Department of Energy or MEA, Maryland Energy Administration, or in, even in the industry, they're like, how do you get those prices? How do you get those prices? And what we explain is that for most installers, a third of their cost is finding customers. So you can imagine an installer might visit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten houses to make one sale. That could be five or six or seven days, including the travel, depending on how far they're moving. But what we're doing is saying we're gathering the customers for them, we're winnowing out the ones that don't have good roots, we're making sure they're serious. And so when they visit, they might visit the same ten of our group and they might get four, five, or six, or seven, or eight contracts out of it. So we're really changing the economics for the installers, and that translates into a really serious discount for, for you all, and that we'll look at that a little bit under the, um, under the prices. Um, then number five in the process is the review, uh, review bids as a group. So what we do is we pull, when you sign up, we pull you and we say, would you like to be a member of the selection committee? You'll also get emails as the process proceeds and say the selection committee is going to meet if you'd like to come. It's open to anyone. And what we find is that in our group, there's usually two kinds of people, and we love them both. There's the kind that really wants to get into it and learn about it and be involved in the details and involved in the selection, and they join the selection committee. And there's the other people that say, I'm too busy, would you just figure it out for me? And they trust their neighbors and their friends and the people in their community to do it. So it works really well. Um, we typically have 15 people or so show up for the selection committee, and we spend up to two or three days, I'd say, and Chris could attest to this because he's the one that's been doing a lot of that work, analyzing the bids. We read them very carefully, we check references, we translate these very long, complex technical bids into a spreadsheet so you can compare them one to another. And then we sit down with the group, it usually takes about two hours, and we go through the bids very, very carefully, and almost always at the end of two hours, we have a unanimous decision and we've selected an installer for the group. Once the installer is selected, then you'll have a specific price, because right now, you're, all that we're gonna be talking about is estimated prices. You're gonna have a specific price for the capacity, and the installer is going to start getting the list of names of people in the order that they signed up. So the first person to sign up would be the first person the installer would visit. And you're going to get an individualized bid. At this point, the installer is coming to your house, and they're going to check everything out at a much finer grain of detail. Your roof, your electrical system, your shading, that tree that's not there anymore because it was cut down since the last Google Earth picture. And they're going to give you a customized, and they're also going to look at your utility bill. 
and they're going to give you a customized bid that's really the, the, what is the optimal size for your spot, which means the system is going to supply under 100% of your annual average usage, and it's going to fit on your roof or on your property. So sometimes you don't have room on your property, on your roof, or in a few cases on your yard for more than 10%, you know? And so the best they can do is give you a PV system, an electric system that's going to cover 10% of your usage. But that's better than nothing. It's a grid-tight system. You're flowing back and forth with the grid. You never are going to even know when are you using your own solar or when are you using the grid solar. Sometimes, for somebody who, you know, they don't use AC, they don't watch TV, they don't have teenagers, et cetera, et cetera, they might have a very low electric use, and maybe they live in a big ranch house that's flat and, uh, you, know, shape, you know, whatever, they might be able to fit enough for twice their usage on their roof. Well, they're not going to recommend a system for twice your usage because that is a waste of money for you. They're going to only recommend covering, say, half your roof to cover 100% of your usage. That's the maximum that the utility, they'll, they'll allow up to 120%, but we're aiming for an optimal, you know, no more than 100%. Because the way the grid tied system works is that for every kilowatt hour of electricity that your system produces, you lower your bill by the same, the value of that. However, you don't get to sell excess to the utility. Well, actually, in Maryland, you do, but you get, only get to sell it at the wholesale price. So it's not a very good deal. And you only get to sell a very tiny bit of excess. So in, in general, the goal is to aim for a balance, that you're producing what you're using. That's the optimal. But you're always constrained, usually in, in, in the city, by space. I digressed a little bit on that. So I apologize on the process. Um, so you're going to get that individualized proposal, and then typically you're given 30 days to accept or decline the proposal. It will come with a contract. You sign that contract. That's the point where you make a formal binding commitment, and you put a down payment, and you would decide to move forward. Um, after that, that's number seven, eight, installation. Um, the wonderful thing is the installation usually takes a day or a day and a half. So a lot of times people think, oh, this solar stuff must be so complicated, et cetera. It's actually very, very simple. They go up there, they put racking on your roof, they screw the panels into the racking, they run the wires down. Usually the side of your house where your electric meter is, they connect behind your meter, and you're done. So it's a, it's a really quite a simple process. Um, I'm going to stop for a minute. That's kind of the overview of the group process and just see if there's any questions before I go on to the second half of the explanation, which is really about the equipment and the costs. Yes, I'm Ian Barclay, and I mentioned to you earlier my concern is photovoltaic versus the canopy. And perhaps we misunderstood ourselves. This gentleman's explanation of, well, the Google Earth is in current because they cut the tree down. He's disincentivized from planting new trees because he's going to look, oh, well, I want to do, do anything to mess up my solar. So that's my long-term problem with solar in this tight urban area where we have, a, blessedly, a large old-growth canopy, more or less. And I'm concerned that it disincentivizes anybody to replace the inevitable uh, dead trees that occur and trees that become diseased or get blown down by storms or something like that. So. I have a real trouble with so that whole problem. Also, I want to get through the solar. Okay, but I really could, appreciate your point. I'm pro tree too. Could you elaborate a little more on the whole business with the utilities and net metering and the business of them starting to say, wait a minute now, when a lot of people are putting solar and they're cutting their bill to the point where the cost of dis generation and distribution systems isn't being met. So they're uh, okay, I'll talk, up, I'll talk kind of about thing, sort of the politics of I read the Wall Street well. Journal, and I've seen there's been a lot of, not necessarily in Maryland, but I think in nearby states where there's been a lot of concern about solar people are sort of free riding, if you will, on the backs of other people who buy electricity right. in conventional means. We will get to that, I promise. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to, um, 
answer that question a little bit later because I want to get through the basics and the issues of trees and net metering policy I love to talk about and we will, I promise we'll get to it but I'm going to slide it a little bit later in the conversation so we can get the basics done first. Hi, I'm Charlotte Shoneman. I was wondering what's the estimated timeline for this and like even a range of Four timelines months. if it's six months to a year or five months to five years or... Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> Excuse me. That's a great question. So usually from the launch of the co-op, which we're a couple weeks into now, until the last installation is about six months. I don't, does that answer your start to finish? Hi, I'm Joan Fry. How long did the solar panels last you referred to? You wouldn't put them on a roof if the roof wasn't going to last as long as the solar panels, but I don't know how long these things typically last. So the panels last, um, they come with a warranty for 25 years, and you, we basically figured they'll last 30 years. Now, is every roof that they get put on have 30 years left on it? Not really, honestly. Um, you don't want to put them on a roof that is going to need replacing in the next 10 years. Many, many people will put them on a brand new roof, um, they help protect your roof. They will lengthen how long your roof lasts because they're going to protect it from wind and rain. But that is roughly, there is this gray area where, you know, if you have like an eight-year-old roof that was not a very good quality roof that maybe is going to last 12 years, there's a lot of gray area. And that's one of the things that we'll help talk through with you. And in all honesty, we're going to be more conservative than the solar installers because the installer installer is going to want to make the sale, and we're going to talk it through with you. Some of the installers have provisions where they will remove the roof, I mean, remove the solar and reinstall it if you need to replace the roof sometime during that 25 years for a, for a set fee. And that's one of the provisions that the selection committee will look at. But in general, you don't want to install it on a roof that's going to need replacing less than 8 to 10 years. Sure. I think maybe you're going to get to this in a minute, so if we are, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, of course, looked at these examples of, of, of costs and benefits and s started thinking, oh, do I want to do option A or option B, and the three, watt, three kilowatts or the five kilowatts, and I'm thinking after what you said, maybe it's not like that. Maybe it's more like when the installer comes to your house, he's going to recommend some one or the other or something in between there or something like that. Exactly. Okay. So... I, that's a good start. Let me talk about the economics. Um, the two examples we have in the column, the three kilowatt and the five kilowatt, are just so you don't have to do the math in your head. So you might get, a, you know, the, like I said, the installer's going to look at your electric bill and figure out the max that you can use, and they're going to look at the, your roof and figure out the max that you can fit, and they're going to try to create an optimal number. And then the panels themselves. So a typical panel is about like that. It's about three by five. A typical panels, they, they come in different capacities. So one of the things that we teach our co-op members is not to think in panels. A lot of people are like, hey, I got 12 panels. Hey, I got seven panels. Panels don't tell you how much capacity you have because the same size panel, one of them might be a 240 watt panel and another might be a 320 watt panel. But for the sake of argument, for the sake of visualizing, Four 250-watt panels is one kilowatt, right? So if you imagine one, two, and on, three and four. Um, they're going to look at your roof, and they're going to say, uh, you know, it might be for you a 3.5-kilowatt system, and for you it might be a 7-kilowatt system because, again, of optimizing that. There really is quite a range. Um, and... It really, uh, in, in D.C. with small town roofs, we're typically seeing a four kilowatt roof that supplies 20 to 60 percent of somebody's use. Um, in an area like Tacoma Park, Silver Spring, that has so much variety in the houses and also even has the potential for a ground mount in some places if you have a sunny yard, um, the... Um, there's gonna be a lot more variety. So just to think about the cost, I've already explained that we measure solar in kilowatts installed. And 
for the visualization purpose, we're going to think of four panels as being one kilowatt, even though that's just for visualization purposes. The cost is measured in kilowatts installed. And what this example here is 450 a watt. I, I can't reverse math about, while standing on the spot. So yeah. 450 a watt or $4,500 per kilowatt installed. That's a little bit high for now, but it's a frequently viewed price in this market still today. Um, many of you, if you've gotten bids, might have even seen bids higher than that. We use that as a base price to give you an example. Without the co-op, without incentives, just cash out, you know, what it would cost. I'm going to go down the three kilowatt example because I know those numbers better and it's easier for me to remember them. So the first discount there is the difference between our estimation of what it would cost doing it on your own versus doing it with the group. Now, does that mean that you will absolutely have that difference between doing it on your own and doing it in the group? Absolutely not. First of all, each group is slightly different because, as I said, you all are going to pick the installer, and there is a huge range of prices out there. So you may be able to get a competitor, a price as competitive with the co-op. In fact, many installers are trying to compete with the groups, and so some of them are like, hey, what did you get? So that's just an estimate, but that is typically what we found. Uh, we've done about 300 installs in the last 18 months, and those, those numbers have been consistent. So about subtract about $4,000 from that 13500 and then the next one, which is the hardest one to explain, is the solar renewable energy credits. The solar renewable energy credits is the green value of your electricity. It is what you get by selling uh, the certificates to um, indirectly through a middleman to the utility. It's how the utility meets their requirements by the state of Maryland to put a certain amount of solar on the grid each year. And you can sell those in a variety of ways. That's one of the services we provide is helping you think through the best way to do it. What we did here for the purpose of understanding the numbers is just if you needed the cash, an upfront payment. And so you could just for one time sell your green certificates for $900, reducing your initial upfront cost down to $8,550. I'm going to pause because I think there might be some questions about the solar renewable energy credits before I move forward. You can absolutely choose to retain them. So if you, for example, want to say, I have a net zero home or a LEED certified home or any environmental claim, or if you have a green business, you want to retain those SRECs. If you sell them, what you're essentially selling is the green bragging rights. Now, the market was designed to promote solar, and so we generally encourage people to sell them, but it is absolutely your choice. And it really depends on your values, your cash flow, and, you know, why you're going solar. Yeah, hi. Is this number you have here for $900, is that for the life of the system or just for one year? So there's lots of different ways to sell your SRECs. You can sell them on a spot market. There's actually an exchange. And if you want to learn more about SRECs, there's two great websites. One is srectrade.com, believe it or not. And there's also a local company called Soul Systems that buys SRECs. You can do a brokerage account. You can do a three-year account. There's many different ways to do it. But this 900 number is if today you sold SRECs for a three kilowatt system upfront one-time payment for a permanent sale. So it's a fairly low number. The SRECs in Maryland aren't that high right now. Many people think they'll go up in the next couple of years, but there's a lot of risk. So if you don't want the risk, you sell them once up front. If you want to kind of play the market and get engaged, you might do a multi-year contract. And if you check out the website there where it says to learn more, join, we have our SREC guide available kind of at the bottom of that website and that links to all the other sites Anna just mentioned. So that gets you to the sort of initial upfront cost, which is about $8,550. And then the next and probably the most important incentive is the 30% federal tax um, credit. Um, the most important thing to remember about that is it's not a deduction, it's a credit. So it comes after you calculated your taxes, you add that much back on, it's a refundable credit. Um, and it's 30% it's of the total cost. So 
If you're buying a bigger system, you're getting a better, bigger tax credit. The tax credit is scheduled to expire in 20, at the end of 2016. So it's something to keep in mind if you're thinking about going solar sometime soon. Sooner is better than later in terms of the tax credit. It may be extended, we don't know. Um, and then the next savings, which we estimate here is $465, is the um, uh, annual electricity savings. And this one, it, it, it's important to spend a couple of minutes thinking about as well, because what you're save, the value of your energy savings changes as the cost of electricity goes up. So if one year you're making, I don't know, 800 kilowatt hours of electricity, it's worth, I'm making these numbers up, so I apologize, it's worth whatever it is. In this case, $465 is the production from a three kilowatt system. If the price of electricity keeps going up, which is fairly typical to what we've seen in this market, that same amount of electricity two years from now might be worth $550. And 10 years from now, that same amount of electricity might be worth $1,200. So what we use is the most conservative estimates of your savings. Um, and then I'm going to just go to the bottom of this so, and then let you ask your question. The last is the Maryland Clean Energy Grant, which is a flat $1,000 for residential. The money sometimes comes and goes, but it's been something that you can, we, we feel comfortable uh, calculating in, in the, um, in the total. That's so your Maryland tax return? That's not the tax return. That's actually a grant from the Maryland Energy Administration. So when you're done with your system, your installer will do the paperwork, submit the paperwork, and then when the money's available, you get $1,000. So it's an incentive towards solar by, by the state of Maryland. So that would bring the total one year down to 4250 for this smaller system. And then that's offset by the electricity in the, su in the subsequent years. Go ahead. Is the federal tax credit all taken in the first year? Um, you can take it over multiple years if you don't have the tax. I think it's uh, five years. You but it expires it. If you before it out. five years. Uh, no, if you, if, you, if you put the solar in by 2016, you can take it over multiple years beyond 2016. So you could take that $2,835 $2, and spread it over more than one year if you want, but you Absolutely. can't get more than that. I mean, that's how much you get. You, you, you can only get 30% of the, the gross cost of the system. Okay. Another thing I was curious about is earlier when you were talking about some examples of when the, when the installer actually visits your house, they might be able to cover 100% of your electricity usage. Well, four hundred sixty-five dollars isn't anywhere near one hundred percent of my electricity usage. So you're, you you were talking about somebody who doesn't like use AC and all that that kind of person, right? When you must have been. It just depends. Like I said, it's this it's this balance between how much you use and how much space you have. Okay. So if you use a lot of electricity, which most of us do, if your roof's big enough, you might cover one hundred percent of your system. But it would be a much bigger system. That another thing is you they might say. Dude, you use a lot of electricity, you have a giant roof, we can fit 25 kilowatts on your roof. And you might look at that bill and say, I think I'll go for 12. And that's just a cash flow issue. It's actually maybe a very good investment with all the credits and stuff, but you might not have the money. So there's a financial, financial balancing that takes place as well. Yeah, just to clarify that 465, that has to be a subtraction of a kind of average yearly cost that a house normally produces. Is that right? Like No, a, it's actually, so it's actually a very predictable number because it's not, it's how much three kilowatts of solar voltaics produce in a year, but, the value of that. But the savings implies what I would save based on what I normally would produce versus what I will produce with a three kilowatt. If I'm, I'm, not, I'm no, just, I'm, it, no, so am I, am I misreading like, that? It's the imagine, I, it's hard for me to do this with one. <laughs> imagine this is your normal bill. Yes. Your normal bill is that big. Sure. Let's say a thousand dollars. Yes, and then you um, a year. Your, uh, you produce this much. Yeah. Right. So, 
four, three kilos is going to produce this much no matter what. Yeah. If your normal bill is this much, the leftover is that. Right, that's what if I was saying. If your normal bill is this much, the leftover is that. So it is a, a subtraction, I guess. So it's just yeah. what you produce, the value of what you produce. Thanks so much. I don't know how to do that without arms. Um, the way I'm reading this is you're, after the first year with the three kilowatts, you are, it's costing 4250 So after the first year, that, that's what you spent. Going forward, you'll save 465 a month. So A year. I, I mean a year. So you got to figure on average it takes about 10 years to make back your investment. Is that, does that sound right? Yeah, and the reason um, we don't give that payback, that number, is there's a lot of different assumptions. So when people model this, they're going to model the average increase in electricity prices. And that number has a huge impact on that number, of that year payback. Okay. So we've been having, there's just a couple years where we had 14, 17 huge increases over a couple of years. So if you think that electricity prices are going to stay flat, then it's that 10-year number you came up. Mm -hmm. If you think they're going to go up at 8% a year, we might be talking about seven years payback. Okay. So it depends. And then the other thing that changes people's calculation is their cost of money. So some people are going to pay for this with money in a savings account. Some people are going to borrow. In my case, I took out a second mortgage, you know, a, a refinanced. So your cost of money is going to affect the payback as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I probably uh, midsummer spend in electric three to four hundred dollars a month. Winter four hundred plus. I have a big house here. I do have the perfect roof with southern exposure. Yeah, You're sunny gonna... all day, even yeah. the winter. So this might be ideal. Um, I've noticed at Home Depot, I don't, I don't mean to invite in competition here. We love competition. Um, That's part, one of the principles we believe they in. They have an ad, they have a, a front billboard sign uh, that you see when you go in now, free installation. Now, would you say that if we band together, we're still going to beat their price? Have you checked them out? I think we've checked them out. But we, I haven't checked them out recently, and I will. They're I'll pretty do competitive, that. Home Depot. Yeah. <laughs> I would be very surprised if they can beat these prices. Okay. I would be very surprised. So one of the things that, first of all, if it was me, I wouldn't have Home Depot putting solar on my roof. I, you really want someone who knows, has a lot of experience. Now, they may have a relationship with an installer. Well, they, they and have I have good contractors. Huh? I mean, they, they've got reputable I, I contractors. Would, I would want to check them name, out, just like the way we check it. them. Yeah. Don't you think? Well... I don't want to get into a debate right. about Home Depot, but we, I, we will check out the prices. We, I looked a couple years ago, and they were selling some modules, uh, and it wasn't a very competitive price, but I didn't know they were doing it now, and so I will definitely check into it. Um, what, they're, what I've seen the big box stores offering in a bunch of places, and it's actually a good segue, is a leasing project product where they're partnering with uh, Solar City or Sungevity or one of these companies that offers a lease. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, let me check into it. But, but my estimate, it's very clear that about 10 years to make back your investment, is that, is that realistic? That, that's realistic. For okay. a lot of people, it's less. And again, it depends on that ratio right. of you now, is there, size, et cetera. There, there's something else I, I, I may have missed. Maybe you're talking about it. Uh, that that you're what you're selling your extra electric or there's something some sort of trade in values uh, some, some additional yeah so um, Maryland has um, in general when I what I want you to think about the your production is that you're lowering your bill by the amount you produce that's the term is net metering and what it really means is you use your solar first and if you're not using your solar, if you're, using, if you're producing more solar than you use at any particular moment, it's running out through your meter and running your meter backwards. And each, at the end of each month, you pay the net between the amount you used minus the amount you produced. In Maryland, if one month you produce more than you use, you can um, run a, a credit. Say you're out of town for, you went on vacation, everything's shut down, 
months, whatever sun is beaming all month, you run a credit, it's applied to your next month's bill. And that can happen just like rollover minutes. You remember those with the phone company? You can have those rollover credits with the utility. In Maryland, recently, they changed the net metering rules. So at the end of 12 months, if you have a credit left, after you've rolled over and netted out for the whole year, you are given a, a cash payment, a check, at the wholesale price. So to give you a sense, you pay roughly 14 cents a kilowatt hour here in, um, in Montgomery County for electricity. And so you're, when you produce electricity from your, your panels, the value is 14 cents a kilowatt hour. When you get the check from the utility at the end of the year, if you've run an excess all year, which is a very rare thing, because most of you don't have enough space to cover your full usage, they're going to pay you at the uh, wholesale price, which is three and a half cents. So it's a very slow payback, but it is possible. So the they'll buy it off you cheap. They'll buy it off you cheap. And furthermore, the Maryland rules say you cannot get permission to connect for more than 120% of last year's usage. So they're going to look at your utility bill, see how much you lose, used last year, and you will not get permission from the utility to connect for a system that is projected to produce more than that amount. So you're limited by the interconnection rule and then the resale. I had a question regarding the SRECs. If you maintain ownership of your SRECs, you, you earn those each year. You produce a certain amount of energy, right? So as long as there's a demand to buy the SREX each year, you'd be able to potentially generate however many units you would produce as long as there was still a market to sell those. Is that correct? Exactly. And this number here that's 900 is actually a heavily discounted number because you're just taking the cash up front. So if you want to play the market, every time your system produces 1,000 kilowatt hours of electricity or one megawatt hour of electricity, you create one SREC. And you can sell that at the time or later. Um, and we have a fairly large amount of detail on our website that talks about the structure of the market, the rules. Um, there, there may be, uh, there have many times in the past been regulations passed or laws passed in Annapolis that are going to change the value of those SRECs. So um, it's really a, a risk tolerance and cash flow decision. If you really need the cash, by all means, sell them. If you really care about taking the credit and you do not, you want to say, I have a net neutral house, I have a green house, don't sell them at all, right? But if, um, if you want to play the market, you have some patience, you have some risk tolerance, you can get a brokerage account, you can go to srectrade.com. And the installers, part of their job, when we talk about the cost, they, that is installation, it's all the permits, it's all the equipment, and it's all these registrations. So we require all the installers to work with us to do all the paperwork for you and also to give you options. So one of the things that a bunch of installers try to do is get you to sell them their, your SREX. And what we insist is that all of our co-op members get a, get a whole suite of options to sell their SREX. Right. And we make sure you, you have those options available. And just for a frame of reference on SREX, in September, they traded at $132 per megawatt hour, just as a frame of reference. You could think maybe three or four a year. Is this an okay time to ask you about a, another model, like another business model of this? So, because I've been really seriously considering this solar city option. I don't know if you're familiar with their way of doing it. But it's just kind of mind-blowing because you can, it's, it sounds, I don't know if it's similar to what Home Depot does, but it's a zero, you, you could literally put n no money down and then you essentially pay a certain fixed annual increase on your energy, right? And so you end up paying that back over the 20-year contract. Can you speak to, is, it, is that model, have you found that to be a, a good model or is there some really downsides that I... <laughs> Let me I just want to, yeah, let me speak to that because there was a lot of people interested in it. Um, so th 
what you typically, this model that he's described is typically called either a power purchase agreement, or sometimes it's called a lease, but lease is really a power purchase agreement. It's not a lease. Um, you're not buying the system. In this case, a third party, uh, it could be Solar City or Sungevity, and there's actually Astrum Solar, there's a bunch of local companies that are doing it. They own the panels. You can pay as little as no zero money down, or in some cases you could pay a small amount down, just like you know a down payment on a house or whatever. You know it changes the the rate. Um, what you pay them for is just the electricity produced, and in this market they'll typically start quite a bit below the current rate. So leases that we've seen, like I said, you all probably pay 14 cents a kilowatt hour for your electricity. And many of the solar city and other leases started around, for residential leases started around nine cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and um, it's a pretty cool option because they own it, they're responsible for it, they maintain it, you pay no money down. In general, and it really, again, it depends on your particular situation, the downsides of it is you're actually not saving as much money. So the SREX, the tax credits, they take all that. You're not eligible for that, they own that. And the most important thing to look at when you're considering that is actually the annual escalator. Because you start paying at nine cents and then it escalates in many of them, it's either 2% or 2.9%, I don't know what you've got there. Um, so if you're paying 2% more each year, that may in fact have you over a certain number of years, actually paying them way more for your electricity than you're paying for your regular electricity. So there's some risk there. It's not a big risk because, okay, so you're paying an extra penny or whatever, you like, it's not a huge risk, but it's something, especially for larger customers, can add up to a fair lot of money. And then the last thing is that at the end, you don't own the system. So you've been paying for the system for many, many, many years, at the end, if you want to keep it, like for the last, ten, like it's a 20 year lease, but they last for 10 years, you have the option of buying at that point. You have to buy at the fair market value, that's what the IRS requires. And it's just, people don't, you don't know what that price is gonna be. So it's sort of the feeling of, I've been paying for this thing how many times over, they already took all the tax credits, the SREX, but I still don't own it. However, um, it really depends on why you want to go solar. And if you want to go solar for zero money down and you want it really simple and the last thing you want to do is worry about it, it's a really great option for people. Um, in DC, where the SRECs are much more valuable, it tends to be a, a starker contrast in terms of the economics where purchasing just makes a lot more options. Uh, you know, makes a lot more sense because the SREX offset, the payback is often like three or four years in DC. When you're looking at a 10 year payback, it's starting to be, um, you know, it's really a preference. Um, it, a lot of, it's, for me, it's really interesting because different people go solar for different reasons. Now, it, for some people who are very ecologically committed, they don't want their SREX sold, they want to retain their SREX, they want to be able to claim the green value of the solar, and so a lease is not a good option, or the PPA is not a good option for them because the third party owns those SREX. So that would be one example. Other people who want to go solar, they really do it as an, thinking of it as an investment, you know, they really want to lower their bill. So the, the really cool thing when you purchase is that first bill you know and it's like the number of times that I've gotten an email or phone call from someone and it's like last month my bill was $150 and this month it's $20 you know and that feeling the purchase is better but if you're just like I want to do it I don't have the cash no bother it's an awesome option and it's it's important for the co-op if you're really very interested in the lease, we, that's why I spend so much time really explaining it to people now, is put that in the preference because there are many installers that offer both, but many installers that only do the installation. So if we have a lot of people that register that want both, then we'll make sure that the winning, or the group will make sure that the winning bidder will, will provide both options. 
and we've we've done that a lot before. You mean PPA and purchasing Purchase, outlet? Exactly, both. Either way, you know the the financed PPA version or the purchase. The other thing I should mention about the purchase option is almost all the installers in this market work with financing if you need financing. So uh, there's an Admiral's Bank loan and there's some construction loans. Many of them offer an interest-free bridge loan until you get the tax credit. So there's a lot of um, options out there for the financing part yeah. of this. I was wondering if you've been at the street festival and have done ev evaluations of people's homes, because last year or the year before at the street festival, we actually stopped at, at some gentleman's kiosk, and he did a, an evaluation and said we weren't eligible. So I'm just curious it if you all use the same It was probably system. a company. Uh -huh. uh, it was probably a, a solar company out there. Uh -huh. It wasn't us. But do people pretty much use the same system, or do you know? Y you know, it's... If you got a really shady house, uh -huh. it's going to come out with the same result. Because uh -huh. um, yeah, to park these tree laws, they, they, it's, yeah, I think it's I an mean, issue. The, um, many people can figure out a way where they have a sunny roof but shade onto their house, which is really lovely. Uh, that's the way mine is. I have my southern side of my house is fully huge trees, but my house is tall, so my roof is sunny. So there's, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes there's maybe one branch, but it's not impinging on the trees. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so in other words, about what you're saying about the leasing option, the PPA, for Power Purchase Agreement, the leasing option versus the buying option is the, the disadvantage of leasing is that you don't save as much money on your electric bills because you're still, you're buying the electricity from them at nine cents instead of 14 cents, which is a little savings, but not a huge savings like, it's like some, the other people are going to get who actually bought their system. Right? Exactly. Okay, got it. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Tina, and I live, actually, I own a condominium here in Tacoma Park in a building that was converted. It's a mid-rise 56-unit building. Um, and I wrote to Gina, and I said, could this work for us? And she said that she thought it merited checking out, so here I am. Um, good details is, is that we're a mid-rise building, um, our roof is up into the upper echelons of the canopy that surrounds us, so our neighbors are more than free to plant as many trees as they want, and we're still going to have good roof space. Um, our roof was replaced about five years ago, so it's probably going to be good enough to, to withstand it. But clearly the decision-making process and the building itself is different than most of the residential owners here. So I'm wondering if you all have worked with a building member like ours and what resources there are, because right now there are probably five owners who think this is like the best thing since sliced bread and are ready to sign. And we've already had one board member come back and say we can't afford it before we even know how much it costs. So <laughs> if we were to make that decision, it would have to be a group decision for us. And I would have to have more concrete information to provide them around the specifics of our building, which I could ask you now, but I don't want to bore all these people. So, <laughs> so I'm wondering what kind of resources would be available for us. Um, let me answer in general about condos to just give you a little sense okay. of how to think about it. And then you can definitely talk with me and or Chris afterwards on some of the specifics. But in condos, there's, there's a lot of challenges. It's multiple units. If your units are individually metered, like each unit has its own electric bill, then, you, then what typically happens in a, in a condo under current law is that the solar system would be used not to offset your individual meters, but to offset common areas. Yeah. So, you know, the halls, the laundry room, the party room, and stuff like that. And that's a really doable option. Often, in fact, the PPA option is an easier option for a condo because it's no money down, unless you've got a building fund or something like that, or a capital fund. Um, it's an easier decision making. So, for a condo, in that situation, it's really the decision making that's the hardest part. And if you um, if you think you're interested, you can sign up, you can get a bid, and then you you know you have time to decide. 
Um, in general, we try to separate condos from houses because they're different kinds of animals, but we can talk to you about it. Um, just one note on the politics, we're gonna maybe get a little bit more into some of the policy context at the very end if people wanna talk about it, but there's been three attempts in Maryland to pass a community solar bill or community net metering bill. It's failed three times. Um, and um, it's really designed for buildings like yours. So if you had a multi-unit building with individual net meters, you could, under a community net metering bill, have one big installation covering your whole big roof, and then you could virtually online apportion 10% to one unit, 20% to another unit, 10% to the common areas, et cetera, and then shift it around as people came and, came and went. So there is a solution for it, but it's not yet available to us in Maryland. No more questions? Who killed it? <laughs> that is a two, she asked who killed it, and I, that is, I don't even have the answer to that, but I know that it, it was strenuously opposed by BG&E Exelon and that that was the biggest problem. Thanks, I have two questions. Um, the first one, our home is a brand new construction that was completed in November and we just moved in in March. I'm wondering, um, you mentioned that for calculating SREX, they can only do up to 100%, 120% and that would help size your system. In a situation like ours where we don't have a full year of history, how would we approach that and what recommendations do you have for us? I do not have a solution for okay. you. Um, we have been working with the utility to address those kinds of situations. Um, it's, and in fact, we're in the middle of trying to come up with recommendations in a different context right now. Our experience has been absolute inflexibility okay. where it doesn't really make sense. They should be able to look at a month or whatever or you could adjust later. Um, we'll keep checking on it. We can put that on Chris's list to check and see if there's been upgrades. There's always one of the things about why we're specialists in this is this field is always changing. And so things like the, those interconnection rules do change over time. So if you email us, we'll double check on it. But my guess, my educated guess at this point is you may have to wait 12 months to get interconnection permission. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then the other question I did have, if we are able to move forward at some point, is there anything with this system that would prevent us from also getting like an emergency backup generator that's fed into the gas lines? You did mention how sometimes the, if the power goes out, you know, they can't, they shut down your solar so it doesn't back feed out to the power lines. That's it, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. We didn't talk about that. So with these grid tied systems, they don't have batteries. You may get a battery, but that's extra and that's different. Um, you, um, if the power goes out, your system has an automatic shutoff. The reason for the automatic shutoff is so that your system doesn't backfeed into the lines while they're repairing the lines. Um, if you get either your own battery back sy backup system or a generator, you can have a wire, basically a toggle that switches it over. Um, so there's nothing that will keep you from having your own gas power generator or purchasing a battery backup system. But it does you, cost money, and it may cost a little bit more for the inverters. Hi. Thanks uh, for addressing all the nitty-gritty of the solar wrecks and who gets to claim to be solar and whatnot. It's one of the issues I have with the solar leasing and, and whatnot. And I've had solar in my house for years and um, have not sold the wrecks, but often hear people saying they're getting solar, getting solar, I'm solar powered, and then they sell their wrecks and then they're not solar powered anymore. But I totally appreciate the, the economics of if you're not ready to do it or don't have the cash, that the solar lease option and the co-op option are fantastic. Um, I have to leave, so I can't stay for some of the more of the discussion, but I wanted to let people know there's a solar homes tour this weekend. I'll leave this copy with Gina. It's a free tour in the DC area and a couple of homes in Tacoma Park. I think one of them may have done the solar lease a couple of years ago. And anyway, it's really fun two-day event. You can check out all sorts of actual installations and talk to people. I don't know how many co-op homes are on there. I'm sure there's loads of them. I, yeah, it's but, a great event. I've done it so. many times, and it's it's really great to talk to the homeowners and hear about their experiences. And there's you can find it online yeah. and download the book. SolarTour.org. Well. They're the oldest and longest, even longer than the national tour that's only 18 years old. This is 24 years old. 
Awesome. But I'll leave this with Gina if you want to look at it. And Thanks. OK, I have two questions. So one is going to show, well, mo both, probably both of them show my ignorance. One is you said you might want to lease if you don't want any of the bother of owning it yourself. So I want to know what the bother might be. You know, what does it mean to buy these? What risks might I be taking? Is there maintenance? Will a squirrel mess it up? You know, is a branch going to fall on it? I, I really don't know. And then the other question was resale. So if, if, if we don't use that much electricity, like he will never let us run our AC, ever. So, you know, we don't use all that much. We still want to do this. But what happens if we sell our house in five years to this? How does it work with resale? Is that generally a good thing to do? First, the um, maintenance issue. So the good news about um, photovoltaics is there's actually very little maintenance. Um, as a homeowner, I can say that it is the item that requires less stress and doesn't keep me up at night. I mean, I still have nightmares about my hot gas hot water heaters when, when their bottoms are going to rust out because I know they're more than 16 years old. Or, anyway, no moving parts, no maintenance. Uh, these systems come with an online monitoring system. You can check your bill. Basically, most people just look at their bill and make sure that their bill is still like, kind of low. And that's it. You don't need to wash them. They come with inverters. What the inverter is, is the piece of electronic equipment that converts the direct current that the panels make to the alternating current that your house uses. And they also, in some cases, modulate the, the flow of the electricity, depending on which ones you have. Um, they um, may not last as long as the panels, but most of the inverters are now coming with a 20-year warranty. So it's really not. There is the squirrel issue. I do hear every now and then that people, yeah, it's actually true. I do hear that sometimes the squirrels chew the wires, um, especially in this, you know, like sometimes you just get these weird squirrels that just chew everything. And so occasionally people do, that happens. Um, they come with uh, strong labor warranties, uh, 10 years, there's the most of them, five or 10 years. And, um, and then long manufacturer's warranty. So there's really not a lot of trouble. But it's still something, you know, if it's not yours and some other company, you know, and the squirrel chews it, they have to come out and fix it. So, Can um, I speak to the squirrel issue? Yeah, do you have a squirrel story? Yeah, so uh, we've had panels on for seven years. And I try to check them every couple of years when I'm up weeding the green roof. But um, on a couple of times we saw... Uh, they had nest. They were they were cutting branches from the front, scrambling up the roof, and doing something. So when I got up there in the spring, I found that they had made a nest, and they had tried to have a family there, but they didn't make it. So they were there. They were living underneath them, but they didn't seem to cause any any troubles That's other than good. noise. Yeah. Yeah. Wait. You had a second question. Resale. Oh, resale. So in general, on resale, there's two issues to think about. On in terms of does it. You have the panels, does it increase the value of your house? Um, the jury's out. When we started this, um, there was not really much data. Um, we talked to a lot of realtors, and what realtors told, her, told us is that it didn't change the value of your house, mostly because appraisal, house appraisal is done by like houses in the same block. So they don't look at your utility bill, or if you have a modern furnace, or if you have solar panels. There's been an, an advocacy movement that's been trying to get laws passed that you would have to declare your utility bill as part of the you know transparency part of selling a house, but that doesn't exist yet. So what we hear in this market is that it's more of a wow factor. It's like, oh, there was two of those houses in Tacoma Park, but I like the one with the panels better. You know, it, people remember it. It's like granite countertops. It, it makes your house stand out, makes it seem cool. Um, what we are seeing in the California market, where electricity is a little bit more expensive and solar is a lot more common, is there actually is starting to be data of value on resale. Um, so we do expect over time that to actually impact the value of your house, but I'm definitely not promising that now. If you have the lease, the PPA, you have to either buy out, when you sell the house, if you buy it out before the end of the contract, you either have to 
buy out the lease from the company or transfer the lease to the new owners. So that's been a concern for some people because they've just not wanted to have an encumbrance and one more thing to worry about. Whereas other people are like, how hard could it be? You know, so. Okay, so um, <clears throat> you said something that made me think because about when, that maybe, and maybe I misinterpreted what you said, but I thought, oh my God, when the power goes out, which happens all the time at my house, that it's going to um, automatically shut off and then I'm going to have to climb on the roof to turn it back on? Or No, 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 no. Or, it, it turns itself back, back on. on. Okay, it okay. just means that if it's sunny <laughs> and the power goes out, you're not getting electricity from your panels while the power's down. Oh, okay. Unless you've bought a battery backup system I to go see. with it. Okay. So which it's like an option when you buy which it. Which is an if option you, you money, buy, you but buy it's that. like another four to eight thousand dollars. So Ooh, it's a fairly. Okay. S we think that batteries is you know going to really change in the next two to five years. They're going to get cheaper. They're going to get more available, but they're not quite there yet in terms of the economic payback unless you're already going to go shell out a whole bunch of money for a generator, and then you should look at the battery backup as you know. Well, maybe this is a good investment because. I'll have free energy to power my generator, and if there really is a disaster, I don't need to go out and find gas. So right. it could be a good deal if you're already buying a generator, but if the economics aren't really quite there for a battery backup on its own merits. Right. Okay, other question, kind of unrelated. Step two in this process is, is to go online and join the co-op, I don't, but there's no website given there. Yeah, we'll I can it. take that. Yeah, if you go right down to the bottom where it says learn more or join, Mm. That's the website um, where you can sign up, and it, you'll see this info, this kind of infographic on how it works. Got it. But at the bottom, there's just a portal where you can sign up, and we'll ask you some questions about your roof, your address, your preferences and installers, that kind of thing. Okay. But the, the short answer is if you go to MarylandMDSun.org, and then you look under Solar Co-ops, you'll find the Tacoma Co-op, and where it's there. Okay. So if you lose the paper on the way home, MDSun.org. Okay, thank you. Uh, how about uh, costs for insur house insurance, if for like fire insurance? Yes. Yeah, so the the question was costs for house or in fire insurance, and what we found is that um, you should, you need to talk to your insurance. I've heard it adds a couple hundred dollars a year from some people. For me. Um, I actually have fireman's insurance, and they lowered my premium because they have a climate commitment. So they actually gave me a discount for having solar. So there's a little bit of a range, but it's not hugely significant. I think that $200 one was a large institutional system. So they'll, they'll be, you know, I think for most people it's like $40 or something like that. Go ahead. He was up first. Oh, you first. Uh, just about this uh, model that you have for the three KWs and the five, uh, that does not include hot water, right? It's no, just, it's just electricity. electricity. Yeah, and uh, do you have that uh, option with some of the stores, or, or you don't? We don't. We the the question is whether we do the solar thermal, or solar hot water, and right. we are we love solar thermal. Um, we don't find it lends itself well to the group approach because the jobs are much more custom. Uh, mm -hmm. much more unique from house to house. And so you don't get the economy of scale by a group. There's also a lot more maintenance. Um, so we just haven't gotten into that sector mm -hmm. yet. Even though that is the energy source that's used the most. It a, you know, a, it I mean, depends. That takes a lot of electricity. You know, some people, a lot of people in this area use natural gas for heating oh, water. Okay, okay. And so that it's... And if you use electricity for heating water, the economics for solar hot water are very, very compelling. Okay. Uh, or if you use diesel or you know fuel oil. Right. For natural gas, especially right now with it very cheap, it the payback is even yeah. though the solar hot water systems are um, very inexpensive, some of them are as little as six thousand dollars upfront mm. for the whole thing. Um, but we just haven't gotten into it. It's right. just not. Um, our expertise. Have you talked to some of the installers about it, though? Most of the installers that do PV right. don't do solar thermal. There are a few that do both, and we can certainly refer people to just on their own do it, or you can talk to an install. If you 
if you sign up and say, I'm really interested in solar thermal too, because some people get, you know, one side of their roof one and sometimes the other, mm -hmm. then if, you know, we can add that into the RFP if you're really interested. But it won't be something that we will be really on top of because that's not our expertise. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is a little bit peripheral. I understand about the SRACs and what they are, but I didn't understand that comment about why you wouldn't sell them and why if you're selling them you're no longer solar, like why you would do that if you have a net neutral house. Yeah, so um, there, it's essentially the green bragging rights it's, is what you're selling. That's what the utility uses to meet their compliance. And so if you, um, for example, if your goal is to have a net zero building and you want to say, you know, 100% of our electricity is green electricity, if you, and you're, you know, maybe you're advertising that, right? So it's, um, then it, it, it matters because you would have sold those green bragging rights. So um, Satwan is, you know, really, really, really passionate climate activist. He's dedicated his life to those issues. And so he really wants to, to keep those SRACs because if he gives them to the utility, then, or I mean, if he sells them to the utility, then the utility uh, doesn't have to go buy them from somewhere else. So there's only a certain amount that the utility has to buy, right? So if you keep yours, then the total number of amount of solar would be higher. So that's kind of the thing. I don't know if I gave justice to it, but if you um, really want to say that you still have solar on your house no matter what, and the electrons going into your system are coming from your solar panels, but it's, the, it's essentially like if you're going for a formal accreditation, green building, you're, pub, you're doing um, like PR, like your restaurant is green, et cetera, and you've sold those SRACs, then um, people will frown on that. It's, it's sort of a degree of purity, I guess. If you've heard of like LEED or U.S. Green Building Council ratings and that kind of thing. But what we find, honestly, is we find that most homeowners are going to sell the SRACs. And that in f what, what I say to people, and it just shows sort of where I am on the uh, political spectrum, you know, more on the pragmat pragmatic scale, is that I want to see the whole grid have more solar in it, but I'm not going to say, well, my house is uniquely green. I'm going to say I help get more solar on the grid. So that's how I look at it. But um, if you want to say my house is 100%, you know, net zero, then you're not supposed to sell the SRX. Uh, panels versus tubes. Could you talk about that? We've only got panels. So there, there really aren't tubes on our market. There's tubes for solar thermal. So mm -hmm. you, you see tubes on somebody's houses. They are usually filled with glycol, and they're being used to heat hot water. So what we have in this group is uh, silicon panels flat, very hard, very durable. Withstand hail, withstand storms, et cetera. Uh, my understanding then of the SREC is it's, it's parallel or similar to uh, carbon credits where if you were not, not burning things, you can be good about that or you could allow somebody to purchase your carbon credits and then General Motors claims it's, that they have a It's exactly the factory. same concept. It's just a different regulatory construct. Yeah, yeah. gotcha. Okay, so I just thought of another one. Uh, when you said it withstands hail and stuff, what if it snows four inches and it's just snow sitting on top of them? Then what, do they still work? If it snows, do not go on your roof to clean off the solar panels. No, I'm I not, repeat, I'm not gonna do that. you would be surprised how many people. <laughs> you will not get any or almost any production while there's four inches of snow on your panels. However, the panels are usually installed at an angle. They warm up in the sun, and that snow just slides off in, in D.C. Unless there's a giant blizzard, it's usually the first thing that, that gets cleaned off. So you just miss a day of production. And like I said, do not go on your roof to clean off oh, your I'm panels. Never goes on my roof okay. never. You would be surprised. I mean, people get so excited about their solar, and that first snow comes, and they're like, I'm going to go brush them off. And I'm like, no. It's too slippery up there, so don't do it. The squirrels will do it. Uh, you, who is next? <laughs> <I'm Yeah. up. laughs>
Um, with the um, with the co-op approach, how do you go about handling disputes within the group that uh, may uh, stagnate the um, proceedings? Uh, quality versus um, uh, cheap panels, for example. Um, so th the big decision making is done one night. We usually convene around seven. And basically, when people get really tired and hungry, they come to an agreement. <laughs> and we've actually only had one that didn't end up unanimous. And it's never really been about you know cheap versus. So first of all, all the panels, we are not even entertaining bids from any companies that aren't using the top ranked panels, tier one panels. Um, the highest rating, we check their rating in the California Energy Commission, et cetera. So the, the quality of the equipment is top. Um, sometimes people want super high capacity panels and that's usually an add-on option. And um, th some of the intensity in the decision making is actually around American-made panels where it tends to be more of a political issue and very, uh, Great people could have a different view of that issue. And the, the solution has been that now almost all the installers that work with us offer an option. So uh, the, it, the disputes in the groups are around subtlety. Like this company is local and we know them, but it's small. And this one is maybe further, but bigger and maybe could handle the size of the group. So it's. They're very subtle, very reasonable, well-considered debates, and usually people come to a consensus around it. So there could be a choice of panels? Once you there get could be a way. choice of panels. It's actually very common. Almost all our bids, there's sort of a base uh, panel and inverter, et cetera, and then there's optional upgrades or, or variations. Some of them have upcharges if there's uh, you know, a very steep roof or a slate roof, or if you want a ground mounted, you have, you maybe you have a beautiful shady house, but then there's like a big sunny yard and you want to put, you know, make a gazebo in the back and put panels over that, um, that would be an upcharge. So there's usually the base price plus upcharges. And that's how it handles those. Um, the, um, sometimes there's, you know, companies that offer the PPAs and don't. And whether that really plays heavily into the decision more depends on who shows up to the selection committee meeting and the, and the polling. Because we'll always go back to the polling and say, look, you know, 15 out of the 30 people said they're really interested in PPAs, so we bring that data up too. But it's, it's almost always been really a very strong um, consensus. It's really actually my favorite part of the process because we, it's a meeting, it's a very intimate meeting, sort of like tonight, but we go really into the details of the equipment and the installers, and it's really a very intense education, and usually people come to a common decision, which is it's pretty cool, actually. Well, you actually just answered the question I was going to talk to you about, ask you about panels, um, but I've never heard of one that says super panels. What is that capacity? What's the percentage of energy reduced per Super panel. panels? You just said something about a uh, supercharge. I something. said tier one. Which is, and what is the production capacity then? Uh, Over 24%? Oh, above 25%? I don't remember numbers. Do you know remember numbers? We'd have to uh, look it up for you. Okay, no, that's the ones out of California. That's yeah. the ones. Yeah. Yeah, they're kind of like a certifying I think we're going to do maybe two or three more questions and then wrap it up, but then we can stay and ask, you know, answer any more questions you have at the end. But the, uh, the logistics of getting a new roof at the same time, is that something that the solar contractor is going to help with or do we get a roof first separately and then? That's a great question. So what if you need a new roof at the same time? Obviously, when you're getting a new roof is a great time to go solar. Um, some, uh, a few of the installers in our market are both roofers and installers. And so if you're going to need a new roof, definitely write that down. And if you're interested in combining the process, when you sign up. Um, 
And that's, a, one of, that's actually a great example of one of those more divisive things within the selection committee is the, the companies that do roofing versus not because sometimes a couple people really want to do it and the rest of them don't care about it. Um, so it, you're going to have to, you can make that decision afterwards. In general, you're going to do it on your own and what we're going to do is just help you coordinate with the installer. Uh, in general, what the installer most loves is a brand new roof. So what they're going to tell you is get your roof and then we'll be there the next day. But um, there may be some emailing and conversations depending on a few installers. Sometimes people, for example, they get a solar ready roof so they get the brackets or braces installed before and under the roof and some of them don't. It, it's, it's, it's easy to work out at that point. But if you do need a roof, definitely write that down on the sign up. That looks like I think I've exhausted everybody. I want to thank you so much for your patience and your wonderful questions. And um, feel free to contact us. And again, if you forget the, if you lose the paper, the website is marylandsun.org, mdsun.org. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you Chris. Thanks for coming out. If anybody uh, had questions about a roof assessment email they've already received, I'll be happy to talk about that too. I know a few folks have. Thanks.